Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to start with the important bits, which is the acknowledgements. Um, several people have uh, contributed in, in certain ways to the development of these ideas. Um, I've got, I have some students uh, who've contributed, um, and, and some of this is uh, I'm talking about is some of the work they're actively involved in. Um, I'd like to thank um, Global Challenges, Universities Alliance, um, SLU, um, and then uh, the organizations that I'm also associated with in South Africa. Okay, so which of these children will become famous mu musicians? Any ideas? Okay, it turns out that these four are famous musicians. And they are of the band, uh, the famous uh, Swedish band, ABBA. Um, so how do you go about predicting which of these children will actually become famous musicians? So uh, at this stage, when they're babies, it's extremely difficult. Maybe it becomes easier as they, as they grow up and they show some, uh, some uh, maybe early musical talent. You might uh, think that, uh, and, and maybe in the early years of a band, you might think that there's some uh, capacity for them to develop. Maybe when they become, uh, when they launch their first record, um, you, mi you might uh, give you some indication that they may become popular elsewhere in the world. Um, which of these thousands of organisms that we know in the world will become invasive um, if they're introduced. Luckily, we've got a, a good framework with which to, um, to deal with uh, these sorts of problems, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this scheme, um, which has been uh, most recently uh, expanded on, on in, uh, by uh, Blackburn and colleagues. Um, so there's various stages. There's uh, a, a transport stage, um, an introduction, an establishment, and a spread stage. Um, these, are, these are barriers, um, and an organism needs to be able to cross each of these barriers in order to ultimately um, become invasive and to spread. So we can conceptualize this as, a, as an introduction, naturalization, and invasion continuum. Um, so there's, there's a continuum from, from this side uh, to, to, this, uh, uh, to the invasion stage. So if we look at this continuum over here, here's the introduction, naturalization, invasion. Um, we've got a pre-border stage and we've got a post-border stage. Um, so these are the barriers over here and uh, these are the different stages. Um, there seems to have been a lot of effort um, at this stage, pre-border stage, trying to identify species that will become invasive, trying to prevent them from being introduced. That makes a lot of sense because if you can prevent them from getting into the new region, you could save a lot of money, save a lot of effort. Um, but I'd argue that there's not been enough effort on this at this stage, the post-border stage. Um, so I'm going to expand a little bit on this, although I'll also mention the, the pre-border stage as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about uh, in this talk are four approaches or tools, um, these four watch lists invasion debt as a concept um, and how this can help us conceptually, early detection, altitudinal survey. So these are the four tools or approaches. Then I'll talk a bit more about challenges and then finally I'll conclude with meeting the challenges. How do we um, meet these challenges uh, that we have? So this is where these four tools fit into the scheme. So watch lists are concerned here with uh, the um, geography or the, the transport stage, the invasion debt comes into, uh, this, into these stages. Uh, early detection is also probably in these stages here. And then the altitudinal transects um, spans uh, several different stages. They can be used um, to address uh, issues at, at several, several points. Okay, so um, a point that's important to make here is that capacity and funding varies throughout the world. This is a map of, um, of GDP, and you can see the, the darker uh, countries have more resources, the lighter countries um, have fewer resources. And the point I'd like to make here is that um, often simple tools may be best for many regions. Um, certainly, uh, there are a lot of sophisticated tools out there, um, but they're not always appropriate in all circumstances. So I'm going to talk about some, uh, firstly I'll talk about, the, um, about risk assessment and, and how watch lists fits into this. So in terms of risk assessment, um, there are many different uh, schemes available, and they use primarily at um, the pre-border stage um, to prevent 
um, introduction of species. Um, but some of these schemes require a lot of data, um, and that's a problem in, in many situations. Um, there, there are many um, quantitative risk assessments available um, in academia, and people have written and developed many of these schemes, but actually there are not many of these that are actually being used in policy. So we've got this um, uh, research, implement, uh, research implementation gap, essentially. Um, so now I move on to the first of the, of the topics, and that's watch lists. Um, so this is the idea behind a watch list is a rapid approach for identifying species that are known to be invasive elsewhere. Um, and you'd use um, different criteria in order to identify these species that you really don't want to come into your country or into your region. Um, so if we take um, all species that are invasive elsewhere um, from, a, let's say, a global list, we know these things are invasive. So you really want to try and keep them out if possible. If you then determine uh, areas that are climatically suitable, so does your region or country have areas that are climatically suitable for any of these? And then do you have a pathway um, that's available, uh, that's, that's likely to result in the introduction? So if you combine these three sources of data, you can develop a watch list. The idea behind this is that it's rapid and easy to, to develop such a list. Um, so if we, if we uh, look at the invasives elsewhere, um, you can use um, invasive uh, species listed in the Global Invasive, uh, in Global invasive Species Programs uh, website, and you could use distribution data from uh, GBIF in order to um, determine climatic suitability. You can use a, a climate match using, uh, say, climate zones, very simple approach, um, and then pathways, data, you would need probably trade and tourism data for your country um, to determine areas uh, of the world that would represent high, medium, and low risk, for example. Okay, so um, we, a student of mine uh, did this. She uh, developed a list, a watch list for South Africa using this methodology, and uh, we have 400 species on the watch list from um, several different taxa. Now, these are 400 species that could come in uh, and that, are, that, are, that would cause a lot of trouble if they did come in. Okay, so this excludes the ones that are already in the country that are a problem already. So these are the ones we really don't want to come in. Um, and one of the reasons we've got so many is because we've, such, we've got such a range of different climatic um, conditions or climates in South Africa, and um, many regions are climatically suitable in the world. So uh, that probably accounts for why we already have so many invasive species. Um, so if we look at a uh, watch list for South Africa, um, the red are, are really the areas that we need to watch out for, um, where we do a lot of trading with, where there's, where there's some climate suitability, at least some match to, to our region. Um, so the orange are, are slightly less and the, the yellow being the lowest, the white we don't really need to worry about. So I don't think we need to worry too much, maybe southern Sweden, uh, there, there might be something. Um, okay, so the idea behind this, uh, these watch lists is to prevent high-risk invasive species from being introduced into the region. And um, they're useful for developing countries because it's a simple methodology. Um, they can and should be updated regularly. And um, for this, we need a reliable um, worldwide database of invasive species. We need to know um, from around the world any species that have been recorded as being invasive because this is an, a, a way of determining whether something um, would pose a risk. And also we need trade and tourism data for the focal country. So in, in, a, in a country where you don't have that kind of data available, it would be difficult to um, establish this kind of watch list. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna talk about uh, the concept of invasion debt. Um, and this is, uh, I, I believe, a useful concept and it, it focuses our attention more on the introduction uh, an establishment uh, phase rather than um, on the, on the, the, the pre-border, the, the transport stage or um, before introduction. Um, so one thing we know is that there's a long lag between um, something being introduced and something becoming invasive in, in the end. Um, now the current patterns of invasive species are better explained by past than current human activities because of this long lag phase. Um, 
Now, a concept of extinction debt was um, defined by Tillman. And uh, he defined this as the time delayed extinction of many species in rem remnant patches. So if you clear a landscape, for example, and you have some natural patches left, um, you know that many of those species within those natural patches will go extinct in time. It's predictable um, because uh, they no longer are, are no longer able to survive. We're going to use the same concept in invasions. Um, and we argue that the seeds of future invasion problems have already been sown in many cases. Okay, so what we've done in the past um, is going to result in many invasions. So in other words, the problem is already there. We just have to wait for it to emerge, which is an uncomfortable feeling. Uh, so we have, uh, to put this into context, we have invasion risk. Um, and this is concerned mostly with uh, pre-introduction um, through to invasion. Um, in invasion risk, there's less certainty about the invasion. So if you're dealing with invasion risk, you're often dealing, you're looking at, you're looking at it from before introduction. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot more uncertainty about um, whether something will actually become introduced and will become a problem. Um, and the emphasis is here with invasion risk is on preventing introduction. Uh, whereas if we're looking at invasion debt, we're focusing attention um, on species already in the focal region. Um, because something's already been introduced, there's more certainty about the invasion. You don't have that uncertainty about the, the transport phase, whether it can survive transport, whether there's a pathway for it to get in. It's already there. Um, the emphasis here more is, is on, more on urgency because it's already in the country, it's already there, um, it's a matter of time usually before it will become invasive. Um, it also aims to quantify the size of the invasion problem um, throughout, a, throughout a particular region. Okay, so um, if we define invasion debt, um, we can define it um, as the additional amount of invasion that could take place in the future based on the pool of alien species that have already been introduced. Okay, so it's what's already in, the, in that country. And we can express it in three different ways. We can express it um, firstly as the additional number of species that could become invasive, or the additional area that could be invaded, or the additional impact that could result from the invasions. So I'll explain this now in terms of a diagram. So if these are the global non-native species pool, okay, so this is everything that's not in your country or region. Um, some of those have been introduced, um, and there is a risk that some of those will be introduced. So that's the introduced pool, and that's the, um, uh, the pool that, imp that, that implies some sort of a risk. Um, some of those introduced species will become invasive or have become invasive. And those that are still, to realize the full potential of the invasion represents the invasion debt on a species level. Okay, so that would represent your species level invasion debt. Um, in terms of area, um, there's a large area in your region or country that is uninvaded. There is a, a region that has already been invaded and then there's a region that could be invaded. That represents the invasion debt in terms of area. Uh, and then if we move on to cost or impact, um, there are current benefits associated with many um, alien species. Um, there are current costs um, associated, and then the invasion debt represents those future costs that will be experienced, and then there's also um, a future benefit that could be realized in the future. Okay, so now um, I'll explain how this gets used, how we could use it for prioritization. So each one of these dots represents a species. And uh, this, this is the area currently occupied. So this one here has a large area that's currently occupied. This axis here is the invasion debt. So this is the, the area that could be invaded. Um, and you can you can see the, the introduced species um, fall in this region, the naturalized species are here, and the invasive species are here. So these invasive species, um, some of these here have uh, expanded to invade all regions that they could invade. Whereas something up here um, in this region, these are high priority species. These are, um, they haven't invaded a large area, but there's a, a great potential. So we really should 
try and um, target these ones and possibly try and eradicate these ones. Um, these ones over here, low priority species, we don't have to worry about them too much. Um, on this axis here, this is the future benefit relative to the cost. So um, you're going to get most benefit if you deal with the ones that are high up on this axis and it, it becomes less as you go um, down. Um, the area or the impact per species increases this way and the number of species luckily is decreasing as you move that way. Okay, so this is a good way for us to, to try and prioritize um, how we deal with uh, these, these particular species. And we believe that invasion debt is a way of um, determining this. Um, so how can it be used? Um, I just need to keep, keep track of my time because I don't want to go into coffee time because I should imagine people will get a bit upset if I do that. So I just need to try and keep on track. Um, so invasion debt, it can be used for um, prioritization of species within a country. Um, it can be used to assess the magnitude of the invasion problem in the country. So it's about what could could become um, a problem in the future. Um, to, it's also useful to compare the magnitude of the invasion problem among countries or regions. Um, we can also use it to compare um, invasion debt per taxon. For example, uh, in uh, Southern Africa, acacias are a big problem and uh, also pine. Um, so you could maybe compare groups across regions or countries. And I think probably most importantly, is to draw attention to the introduced and the naturalized species, those ones that we already have in our region. Um, we're busy writing uh, a paper and we hope to submit it probably this week um, to conservation biology. Um, okay, so that's the invasion debt. Now I'm moving on to the third um, component, which is a much uh, uh, shorter section, um, and that is early detection. Uh, so in terms of early detection, we um, consider the introduced and naturalized species with small populations. We're interested in focusing on those ones. Um, small populations because um, there's uh, a lot that you can do if, there's a, if it's still a small population. It means the problem hasn't become large yet. And we'd, we'd like to identify which of these um, species with small populations are likely to be invasive because the earlier you act, um, the more likely you are to either eradicate or have a major impact with minimal um, investment of resources. Um, for example, um, species in the genera um, that have many invasive species, for example, in, in globally, acacia is a genus that has a, a genus of plants that has uh, many invasive species, also pines. Um, and if you, um, if you look at, say, for example, the pines or the acacias, in a particular region um, that have been introduced. So in South Africa, we have several um, species of acacia that are invasive, but we also have others that have small populations that have already been introduced into our country that are there, and they are probably ticking time bombs. We want to know which, one of those, which ones of those are likely to become invasive in the future. So one of the ideas is to resurvey known localities. So if you um, know for a particular species that it's been introduced for, uh, in our case, forestry trials, or it's an ornamental species. You might have records of it in herbaria, and uh, you could go and you can see, well, you know, this is where it was planted. Is it still there? Is it spreading? Um, is it setting seeds? Um, those sorts of things. So um, the idea is uh, to resurvey uh, re a locality. Um, can you discover this um, specimen? Is it still, is still growing? You know, does it have um, flowers, fruits, and seed? Is it recruiting? So are you finding seedlings growing underneath a particular tree, um, a particular plant? Um, what's the landscape context? Is this thing a, a street tree planted um, in the street where they, they mow the lawn underneath it and it's highly managed and it's unlikely to be able to spread? Or is it something that's um, growing on the outskirts of a town? where there's disturbance and where it has habitat that it could invade in the future. Um, and then you can hopefully draw a conclusion about its invasive status based on what it's doing in, in that environment. Um, and then you can take appropriate ma management action. So if it looks like it's a problem, um, get in there early, get rid of it as soon as possible. Okay, so in terms of uh, resurveys, you want to determine um, whether the introduced 
and naturalized species pose a risk, and then you want to implement some sort of eradication or control um, based on these resurveys. Okay, so the fourth of, of these tools I'm going to talk about are altitudinal transects. So in terms of altitudinal transects, we know that um, uh, if we look at altitudinal range that a species can, uh, can, can occupy, let's say it has some current altitudinal range. So um, this, is, this would be for um, some alien species, not necessarily invasive, um, but it's an alien and it has this, this range here. The altitudinal range gives you some idea of its uh, geographical range or potential geographical range. If it has a very limited altitudinal range, um, it's likely that its geographical range is, is also quite limited because it, it can tolerate fewer environmental conditions. Um, if we look at the future, um, it's likely that the species range will expand into the future to possibly to higher altitudes. And uh, this can be just natural, um, just through time, because the species can actually tolerate um, conditions at higher altitude, but it hasn't got there yet. And also, um, as climate changes, um, conditions that were unfavorable at high altitude suddenly become more favorable. So this can also be used as an index of how far it has or maybe is spreading geographically. So that's the theoretical background to this, uh, to this idea. Um, the thing about altitudinal gradients is that abiotic conditions change over a, over a short geographical distance. And that's um, the beauty of working on, across an altitudinal gradient. Um, and altitudinal range expansions are likely to, as I said, indicate um, geographical range expansion. So if you uh, see a particular species is rapidly expanding its uh, altitudinal range, it's likely that it's also um, in the process of expanding its geographical range. Um, and now spe specifically um, uh, with climate change, it's likely to result in, in uh, altitudinal range shifts and particularly with invasives in uh, range expansions. So here's a picture of uh, a silver and black wattle invading natural grassland in uh, southern Africa. Um, the natural grassland is, are the brown bits, it's what it should look like. These trees here are Australian acacias, which are invading this landscape, and they certainly don't belong in the landscape. Um, so this is um, work that we're doing in the, the Drakensberg Mountains in, um, in, uh, on the border between Lesotho and South Africa. Um, and it's work that I'm doing in collaboration with Yessa Kalve. And uh, this is a, a picture of, a, of the gradient. Um, this is a, a, a road that goes um, high into the mountains and uh, the road goes uh, down the valley into, to a much lower altitude. Um, so the range that we're dealing with here is from uh, almost 3,000 meters down to uh, 1,500 meters. So um, what we've been doing is um, uh, roadside surveys, looking for alien um, plants on, on the roadside. Um, and we've been doing this once a year. And uh, it takes uh, two to three days um, uh, to survey this 20-kilometer this transect. Um, what we do? is we re record the first observation, the highest altitude that we um, observe a particular exotic or alien species at, um, and then also its second and its third um, observation. And we, re we obviously record the position, the geographical position of that. And uh, what we have so far, um, this is a um, number of uh, exotic species or exotic plant species um, uh, across the time that we've been doing these surveys. and. Uh, You'll see the total has climbed uh, across time. Uh, whether this is, uh, it's probably a combination of new species coming into the area, and also um, it may be that we have not detected all of the species over over time. Um, so there's uh, several. Uh, sorry, that that's the total. That's the total over there. This is the uh, the annuals, and uh, this is the perennials here. So this is a a grass species that we found for the first time in, in 2011, and we're absolutely certain that we didn't find it there before. Um, so this is altitude on this axis over here. So this is from, the, from low to high, and uh, with time uh, we see um, in general that species are, are moving upward, um, 
and so this is uh, for the, the annuals being about 27 meters vertically per year, um, and uh, perennials about 14 meters per year that they're moving upwards. Um, we have a total of 94 alien species that we've recorded across this time period. We're not all, we're not all that certain about why they're moving up. Um, the climate has not changed over significantly over this time period. That's a very short time period. So we, we can't point a finger at climate change there. Um, it's probably um, likely to be uh, something to do with detection, but also just due to time. Species have not been able to um, occupy their full ranges, and they, they are um, expanding to occupy their ranges. But uh, almost certainly it's not climate change at this stage. Um, so in terms of altitudinal gradients uh, uh, transects, it's, these are useful for understanding alien plant assemblages because uh, alien plants, they're certainly not there in isolation. There's several of them, so it's a whole assemblage. If you remove one, um, there are others to take its place. Um, I believe that it's quite useful to document range expansions to higher altitude because, as I said, um, you can get an indication of um, how far a species is likely to be able to spread geographically. Um, it's also useful to de for detecting new invasions. So anything new that comes into a region, you're going to pick it up that way. Um, and it can also be useful for documenting climate change responses. So um, rapid range expansion, it could be to do with, with climate change responses. Okay, so now I've talked to you about these four approaches or challenges, and I see we're still more or less on time. Um, I'm going to talk now about um, uh, overall some of the, challenge that, the challenges that we face, um, both in terms of biological invasions and also in terms of detecting um, invasions. So um, I thought, well, I'm coming to the first world, and I thought, well, should I rely on the technology or shouldn't I? And I decided not to rely on the technology. Um, so this is unfortunately not as, as, as impactful as it would be if I was showing you the video. So this is, uh, these, are, these little yellow dots um, are aeroplanes. And these, um, this is available on YouTube. And if you go and search for, for air, um, air, air traffic uh, around the world, you'll see it plays a, a lovely video. So each one of these dots, as I said, is, a, is a, an airplane. I'm going to flick through them now. So you'll see in each picture, you'll see how they move and the levels of activity. And you'll also see the day. Here's the night time here. And you'll see how much, um, look, at, look for, the, for the yellow patches. And you'll see how it changes over time. Different parts of the world are becoming active at different times. So I think what, what that nicely illustrates is that we're living in a really highly globally connected world. Um, which is obviously poses a lot of problems for us. Um, and it also focuses uh, an issue on the human dimension of biological invasions. It's, this is not just about um, natural systems and about biology. It's about humans. Um, so one of the key issues is propagule pressure. Um, how are we moving propagules around? Um, these, the pathways. So how, how do things get around? Um, trading patterns. Tourism patterns, these are, the, these are the way in which things are, are moving around. Um, things like new threats, so this is maybe linking to some of the other um, global challenges. For example, biofuels. Um, let's not make mistakes with introducing species that are good for biofuels because they grow well. Um, and uh, many biofuels, you're probably looking for something with, with really highly, that's really highly invasive. Okay, so let's not make mistakes there. Um, so how are these things going to change in future? These are very difficult things to predict exactly how these are going to change in the future. Um, biological invasions, it's one part of the problem. Global change is the, is the broader context into which biological invasions fit. Um, things like climate change are part of biological, well, they, they're part of global change. There's a direct link, biological invasions, things like pollution, land cover change, fragmentation, all of these things interact in, in, in some way. So we need to bear in mind that biological invasions is part of a broader problem, and these things do interact, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to focus now on climate change because I think that's really a, that's really a big issue. Um, we're looking at an increase in average temperature of up to 4 degrees in the southern hemisphere during the century. 
Um, a friend of mine who's a climate change scientist, he just said, look, he is convinced based on the work they've been doing, we're looking realistically at four. We're not two, two degrees, um, particularly for Southern Africa, he says that would be lovely, that would be pleasant. We're not, we're not looking at that. We're looking at four upwards, um, possibly, more, more than that. Um, the point here is that new regions will become climatically suitable for species that are invasive. So all of those things, many of those things that are invasive now, um, you know, the regions will, will you know, you'll, you'll get changes so that you then would be at risk of, of being invaded by other species. Um, and, and we actually, uh, just to emphasize in terms of the, the climate change, um, we're actually doing slightly worse than the business as usual, as usual scenario. Okay, so we... We're looking, it's looking like it's turning out worse than we expected. Um, we, we need to take some action um, because it's really going to have a major impact on us. Um, in terms of new invasions, um, these are all this, if we look at this pie chart, um, these are all the species that we know or that have been described. Uh, let's look at plants in the pie. We think we have a lot of plants, or we've described many plants in the world. Um, we think we know about many vertebrates. Um, that's, uh, that's quite small. Um, these microbes and fungi, this is probably massively underestimated. Um, and they've just put other invertebrates here in, in this group. But certainly insects are, uh, there's, there's, there's billions of them. Um, we need taxonomists that like small things. I think that's the answer here. Um, uh, in terms of meeting the challenges, I'm going to go through a, a couple of um, ways of, of possibly meeting these challenges, and that's, then I will conclude. Um, so in terms of the, the science, um, what are the knowledge gaps? Um, I believe um, one of the big knowledge gaps, and something that's been recently pointed out, out in the literature, is the naturalization process. We tended to focus a lot on um, the invasion process, but before something becomes invasive, it needs to naturalize. Um, and understanding how it naturalizes and that naturalization process, how it gets through those barriers, we seem to be, I think we've missed the point. We need to focus on this a lot more. Another big issue is the human dimension. Um, we really need a better understanding of, of the human dimension, and we need to involve people who are not just biologists in understanding this human dimension. Um, in terms of management, um, I think invasion debt is useful. I'd be interested to hear your views on whether you think it's a useful concept. Um, early detection, I think there's a lot to be done there in terms of early detection of things that have already been introduced, that are already there. Um, let's try and develop approaches for determining things that are going to become a problem. And then certainly if we know that something's likely to be a problem, we need to be able to respond rapidly. Um, if you're not sure um, what it is, what it's going to do, just get rid of it. Um, then we have this so-called knowing doing gap, this link between the two, um, this sort of science implementation um, gap, which is, which is a real problem. Um, how do you get the science to talk to the management and, um, and vice versa? I think that's a big challenge. Um, I'm going to give you an example from South Africa of this working for water program. So this uh, working for water program, it's um, well known um, in, in many parts uh, of the world for um, being a major program that was um, initiated for the control of alien plants and also the employment of poor people. So it was developed with, with these um, two goals in mind. And the idea is that it uses um, chemical, mechanical, and biological control, but mostly mechanical and chemical means to control alien plant species and to give resource poor people employment. Um, so currently there are 64 different taxa that are being controlled and um, this is an idea of the investment that's been made. So between 1995 when it was initiated and 2008, they spent um, 3.2 million uh, billion uh, rand on that. That's uh, roughly 4, 4, 457 million, around about 2.9 billion uh, kroner. I, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's a big number to you, but I think to me that's quite a that's quite a big number, okay. Uh, and particularly for a, a developing country, um, that's quite a big number. We do have a big problem with um, 
with uh, alien organisms, certainly. Um, recently, there was a, a, a paper that came out criticizing um, this program, which is hailed to be a, a marvelous program. Um, some of the criticisms were, well, it's not sustainable. It's not goal-orientated. It needs to prioritize the species in the areas better. Um, it needs better monitoring and evaluation. Um, so while it, it's perceived to be a really good program, um, it's being largely driven by the, the political um, motivations and about the employment motivations and less about actually solving the problem. So yes, it's giving a lot of people work. A lot of work's being done, but it's not being done properly or done optimally. So there's a great need for this science management interaction. So this certainly needs to be improved to um, reduce these criticisms and actually turn this thing into something that's really good and that, that's really effective. Um, I'm moving on now in terms of, of data. Um, we need global lists of invasive organisms. This seems trivial, but it's really important to know um, which species are invasive around the world. If you try and do some sort of a global analysis, what we tried to do with that invasion debt paper, surprisingly how bad some of these global lists are. Um, if you know something's invasive in another, in another part of the world and you're considering introducing it to your region, don't do it. It's, it's not worth the risk. Um, but if you don't have that list, then how are you going to um, make that decision? Also, local lists, we need to know within a, in a particular region, things that are introduced, things that are naturalized. Those things don't usually make it onto the lists. You only really start to discover them on the lists when they start to become invasive, when I would argue it's probably a bit late. Um, the Global Invasive Species Program um, has been apparently suspended because of a lack of funding. Um, Ten minutes to go? Okay, good. I'll, I think I'm on time. Um, so that's a, that's a, a really important um, a source of global data which we really need. Um, the, in terms of the, the mapping and the lists, um, we have in South Africa a Southern African Plant Invaders Atlas, and it's um, been mapping um, invasive species, uh, on uh, plant species, in fact. Um, so far, it's got a list of 660 plant taxa that are at least naturalized, and 238 invasive species, um, which is quite a number of species. Um, but this is an extremely useful data set for us for understanding where things have spread to for developing models to predict where things might spread to in the future. Um, in terms of resources, um, funding is a, is a big issue. The example that I, I said about um, Global Invasive Species Program um, no longer being funded. This is a real, I think this is a real priority. We need to focus on this. In terms of, of human capacity, I think we really need to invest in taxonomy and taxonomists, and we need um, molecular bi biologists um, because many of these things, the small things, are not, um, we're not going to be able to identify them or um, understand who they are and where they are and where they fit into the picture without using some of these techniques. Um, in terms of the policy, we need an alignment with management. There needs to be an interaction between the science, the management, and the policy. So once you know what you should do, you need to have a policy in place um, to deal with that and uh, appropriate legislation to assist the, the management of the problem. Okay, so to conclude, um, biological invasions, it's a global problem. It needs to be managed at a local scale using both local and global data. And uh, certainly I believe that simple approaches are often better than no action at all. And often we need simple approaches in many parts of the world. Thank you very much.